פרשת ויקרא. פרשת שטאץ, הוא נפל להם פסוק. This is the what? הצלחה בנימין, נתנאל, בן שושנה, דבורה, שרח, בת טובה. And again to all our uh, supporters and, uh, and operators Ba'asher Hem. You know what the code names? Yeah. Yeah, no? Uh, Connie Karen. Karen. Mike. Mike. George. George. And Tuvia. And Tuvia. And Tuvia, I haven't heard from him. Rabbi Bornstein. And Rabbi Bornstein. Very good, very good, very good, very good. And what is Rabbi Bornstein to us? He, he, He is our West Coast uh, operator. operator. He is the, uh, the he's, uh, he's Bravo One <laughs> of the West Coast. Anyway, it says, Vayikra el Moshe vayidaber Hashem elav meol moed lemor. Kadosh Baruch Hu, God called Moses from moel moed to say, Daber el Bnei Yisrael, speak to the Jews, Vayamarta elahem, and you should say to them, Now pay attention, Adam ki yakriv mikem korban le'ashem If a person would bring a korban, a sacrifice, from you to Hashem Min ha'behema, min ha'bakar u'min ha'tzon Takrivu et korbanchem Now, the Mephashim already noticed that there's a little problem with this pasuk And the problem from the pasuk Uh, really stems from the from the usage of the word mikem. Mikem means from you. Mm-hmm. And uh, the Ibn Ezra, the Ibn Ezra, offered three different uh, ways to actually deal with that. Mm-hmm. Write it down. And it says mikem. It says muhar. It comes too late in a sentence, and it should be adam mikem. כי יקריב קורבן, לא אדם כי יקריב מכם, אדם מכם, a person from you, or from among you, and that's going to be like, like, like he's like the many, like the, like the majority of the people, או יהיה מכם מבמוכם, from you, from your, from your money, in other words you can bring קורבן from your own money, או יהיה מכם, רמז להוציא את הגזול, it means it could say that you cannot bring a קורבן Uh, that it's something that you uh, stole or something like this. It means from you. It's really is, is a problem. So according to the word, according to the first uh, explanation of the word mikem, so it says after ki akrib. But in terms of the meaning of the pasuk, it doesn't really refer to that, to that verb, uh, but it really refers to the word adam, adam mikem. It's not, what does it exactly have to do with the korban? And therefore, and because of that, it needs to be immediately right after that. Um, and the two other options that the, the Ibn Ezra brings is also similar in terms of the, the textual uh, way of where does the word mikem should be. And it really has to do with the action, with the, with the, with the verb of yakriv, or to bring a korban. But in terms of the meaning, In terms of the meaning, it really is, uh, they're a little bit different. So according to the first one, the word mikem really refers to the obligation that the korban, the sacrifice, the animal itself, should be in the, um, should be of the owner himself, that he needs to buy it. In other words, it has to be from your money, You have to be korban, and not like, let's say, for example, somebody, hey, you need a korban, can I get, can I borrow, you know, it has to be that you pay for it, and according to the other one, it has, of course, as we say, gazul, to exempt gezel, in other words, that I stole something, I'm going to bring a korban to that. The sforno also explains the word mikem, and the problem is that, you know, it, again, it's so uh, out of place that, It's, it's a problem, and we need to see exactly what it, why is it like this out of place. So the this, this Sforno writes that it refers to the, to the verb of Yakriv, which is right next to it. Right? Because it says, Adam ki Yakriv mikem. So therefore, the word mikem really goes to the action of bringing the korban, bringing the sacrifice. And, and basically, what he's saying 
in, a, in, a, in a way, like a little bit of a total, totally different meaning of what we would think. It says, Adam ki yakriv mikem, ki yakriv me'atzmechem bevidui dvarim v'achna al derech u'neshama parim sefatenu. Based on what it says in Hosea 14, right? That it has to be mikem, in other words, from you. You have to really humble yourself to bring a korban, as it, and it brings the pasuk, zivchei elokim, what's zivchei elokim? When you bring a zevach, a sacrifice to, to, to God, it has to be ruach nishbera. You can't bring God, a, a, you know, a korban and says, uh, hey, yo, God, you take this. Don't forget to say thank you. Send you the bill. It has to be in a real humble and really down uh, uh, in a state of mind because you, you really need to bring a korban because you did something wrong. You're not doing God a favor. Let's get this straight. So, and he, he the sword of basis on this psukim that we have over there in Tehillim uh, 51, right? He says, and he says the following, God doesn't need favors from those fools who kind of do God a favor and say, okay, listen, I brought you this yellow, let's call it the day, you know, call insurance, it's, it's okay. And Chazal already says, and he brings Mikem Velokulchem from you, but not from all of you. In other words, and who is that? Leotziyat Mumar, and that's brought in the Yerushalmi. Mumar is a person who who is uh, who changes faith. A person like this, God doesn't want you to bring a korban. You don't believe in me? You change your faith? We don't need your sacrifice. So that's that's why it's learning from that. So according to the Sforno, the whole, the whole idea of the word Mikem comes to really show us that, the, uh, that what we call the act of bringing a korban to sacrifice. Again, and I told you this years before, the word korban in Hebrew is not what we refer to in English, which is sacrifice. Sacrificing is that I'm bringing something for myself and I'm kind of, I have to sacrifice it, you know, I kind of let it go. The word korban in Hebrew comes from the word karov. Shoresh is kuf, resh, bet, karov. And what does it korban has to do with that? Why is it called korban? When does a person need to bring korban? A person brings korban, first of all, you want to eat pizza, buddy? Hey, when a person does an avera, you know, he did something, he did a, what we call a sin. Again, the word avera and, and, and sin, or chet, should I say, chet and sin is two different things. When a person does something that he was not supposed to be doing, based on what the Torah tells us, the punishment is immediately in the action. What does it do? It puts a gap. It puts a gap between you and God. And that is the punishment. What we call the punishment, it's really not a punishment. It's really an atonement for that sin or that avera that we did. Again, I'm using the word, the English word sin. So there, that's a kapara, okay? For example, let's say a person was a buffoon. He ran a red light. He deliberately, ran, I mean, he ran a red light. Not knowing a red light, you know what happened? He crushed into a truck, a parking truck. So he ran a red light. Now the call, of course, he got injured to bring it to the to the thing, and now policemen also gonna give him a ticket now. You ran a red light. You ran a red light it has nothing to do with the fact that you broke your, your legs and arms and whatever it is, it has nothing to do with the fact that you ran a red light. So you're going in front of the judge. And the judge sees you already, you know, like this all, you know broken up and, and and he says okay 
What am I going to do to him? You got to look at him. But still, you got to pay. So the, what we call a punishment is not really a punishment. It's an atonement for your sin. You got it. You already, and what, so therefore, what's the punishment? The punishment is the distance in which you had put yourself between yourself and God in the act of going out of his ways. That is the punishment. Because if the guy already got smacked from the truck, the judge says, what well, I'm going well, to do to him? No, it's already, look at him, he's all cold, limping, and it's like, you know, he has bangs here and bangs there. He got, he got his lesson. You still have to go in front of the judge. But you already got punished. Well, I'm going to punish him. I'm going to give him $50 for a red light. I mean, look at the guy, man. He's like in a wheelchair, all, all crippled up. The, the punishment is that. So now what happens? I got a distance. And how do I overcome this? Well, I need to seek closeness. And then offering something that usually, you know, it's expensive to you. If you're going to give me something, let's say you want to be my friend. I mean, of course, who would not want to be my friend, you know? So you got to do something, man. But just say, hey, buddy, let's be buddies. Okay, good. But we fifth grade. How do you do? You buy something. You, you, you show that you care. You need to show that you care. Koban comes from closeness. I want to seek closeness to Hashem. I cannot come empty-handed. I understand what I did. I understand it to hurts now. But it, it comes from that. So if this is the attitude, that the only reason why I need to bring Korban is because I put a gap between me and God, well, I cannot come all, you know, all jolly now. I need to understand that I did some damage and I caused damage to this world, to the, call it the harmony of the world. And that's what Korban is, Korban is all about. And that's the attitude it has to be. And that's why it says, the, the Navi tells us, I don't, I don't want those, the Korban from these people that think they're doing me a favor. So if you look carefully in the, in the Ibn Ezra, you might actually understand the the depth of the, of the opinion of, of Chazal when they refer to the word Mikem and, and to what it is, or for example, when we say to take the person who is a heretic who doesn't believe, uh, because for him, why, why the Mumar has to do with this? Why, for example, a person who is Mechalel Shabbat, we don't take the Korban? We don't take a Korban. If a Gentile will come and he wants to bring a certain Korban, he can bring but a Jew, Michalel Shabbat, he can't. Is he not considered Jewish? The great Shabbat? No. Because for him, but he's bringing Korban, man. He's bringing Korban. Because the reason is, because for a person like that, the act of bringing the Korban is only external. It's just paying lip service. So when we said the word Mikem, means from you, from within. Mikem. Ki, uh, the, the Pasuk says, Adam ki akriv Mikem Korban Lashem. From you. From inside of you, not from the external part of you. If you look at the word mikem, if you look at the numerical value of mikem, how much is mem? 40. 40. 40. Half? 20. 20. 20. Together? 60. Plus another mem? 100. 100. Adam ki avi korban mikem from your 100%. Because you want to. Don't do me a favor, don't give me 80% of you. I want everything from you. Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives us everything 110%. When we commit ourselves to this lifestyle, to this way of life, are you committing yourself 100%? I'm not sure that any of us could reach that 100% you know, giving. But we should definitely want to give 100%. Mikem, from your 100% I want. The problem that we have is a problem of commitment. And the problem we're, we're afraid to commit is because, we can't, because then we'll have to do something. We'll have to make a decision to commit. And we don't want to commit because we're afraid of failure for whatever reason. But don't you understand failure is a person who is not willing to commit or is not willing to give 100%. Because you cannot succeed if you haven't given at least 100%. 
Why? Because there will be plenty of people around you that will give 100%. And that's nothing special. How are you going to go and actually reach somewhere if there are those people who give 120, 150 percent? Most people want to give not even 10 percent, and they think that they already own something. And that goes to everything. That goes to education. When you learn, it has to go with working out. And why did I tell you like a million times? It should be uncomfortable. It should feel hard. It should feel painful. Because this is the threshold that you reach, that you say, okay, this is where the real work starts. The real work starts when you're feeling, when you're lifting weights and you're feeling like it, it hurts. So everybody will tell you, and that's what my, my teacher told me one time. He said, you know what's the difference between those, the Olympians who go and in the, and, and everybody else? He said, everybody else will tell you, when you're feeling a little pain, you should stop. For those people, it's when the pain starts, that's when the workout really starts. We fall in love with our, oh, it's too difficult. And you want a Kadosh, we coming to a Kadosh Baruch Hu, with a sense of entitlement. You gotta give it to me. Nobody has to give you, needless to say God, but nobody has to give you anything. You want something? Get up and get it. Get up and get it. And it's not only in America, it's anywhere in the world. Whatever you want, you will be. Don't blame anybody else besides you because if you really, really, really wanted it, You'll do it. Okay, I mean, if you really want to develop wings and fly, that's not going to happen. We're not talking about something like that. But by all means, you can learn how to fly. Go, go become a pilot. Take a course. Well, it's a lot of money, so go work. But I don't want to work until so you don't really want it. Because if you really want it, you'll do it. And the same thing with, you know, everybody wants to be enlightened. Everybody wants to be, you know, to have those powers and to be the, the, the Baba Sali. You, even for that, you got to put work. And it has to be 100%. You need, and I said to you before many, many times, you need to commit before you start doing what you're doing. Not after a while you're in the process, okay, now I'm going to commit. You can't do that. You're not going to make it. You need to know what you want. You got to commit yourself to it. And then you're going to plow through it until you're going to get what you want. Don't take no for an answer. It's hard. Okay, it's hard. That's good. That's good that it's hard. Because if it's easy, something is wrong with it. If you work hard for your money, that's good. It means you're honest. Because easy money usually is not honest money. Usually. Show me one way that you can make easy money that is 100% kosher. Oil. Oil is not easy money. See, when it comes to, to stocks and stuff like this, when you don't know what you're doing, there's no difference between that and gambling. The only difference is probably worse because at least when you go gambling, you know that that's what you're doing. You can't blame anybody else. And at least you get a free drink. You drink? Yeah. My man. <laughs> what, what do you usually like to? It depends what I'm doing. <laughs> I like that. I'm eating dinner, you know, glass of whiskey, wine. A whiskey? Well, don't tell me, Michaela. Done with it. That's good. Try, try bourbon. It'll help you with your beard. Huh? It will help you with the beard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's good. It's good. Not below. Very good. Anyway, so when uh, according to the according to the uh, to the Orachaim, 
Rabbi Chaim Ben Atar, it says the ability of a man, even if he's a high level, even if he's the highest level, let's say like Moshe Rabbeinu, to get so close to the Shekhinah, to get so close to Ribbono Shel Olam, is only because you're doing something from Am Yisrael. Four or five? Four, for the sake of Am Yisrael. Let's look at the Pasuk now a little different. So right now we spoke about sacrifices, biggest sacrifices, goats, sheep, buffaloes, whatever. <coughs> Let's read like this. Vaikra el Moshe, right? And Hashem called to Moshe and he said to him from all Mohed, the better Bnei Israel, and you should tell to the Jews, Vamartailem, Adam, ki akriv mikem korban le Hashem. If a person wants to get closer to Hashem, it has to have a purpose. That's the difference between Judaism and, many, and most other religions. The gift of closeness or the permission to seek closeness is not just going to come like that for, for the sake of, here, buddy, you know, I'll, I'll throw you a... You have to have a, a reason for that. And how it's going to be? Gonna be? Mikem, <coughs> from you. For you, like Mikem, also from, from you, or for you. Like for me to you. So, and the chashivut, and why is that? Because he understands, a person like this understands the, important, the importance of every Jew, of any, anyone. And the Ora Chaim explains the whole parashia of the Korbanot in, in a very, of course, in a very detailed fashion, but let's look at something else that it says. On Derech HaRemez, it says that from them, from the issue of the Korbanot, he learns the chashivut and the level of Klal Yisrael, each and every one of us. Now I'm going to tell you this. Before you, if you're in the Air Force, okay, one thing you do before every day, before this plane starts, you know, takes off or whatever, you do a DI pre-flight. Daily inspection before the flight. Now, maybe a helicopter is a little different, but I'm talking about jets that fly fast and they do crazy maneuvers. One of the things they do is to check the envelope, the outside uh, cover, which is aluminum, of the fuselage, whatever it is. And what are they checking for? They're checking for missing rivets. Or sometimes the rivets, because the aluminum has to be stayed together, Right? So sometimes, because of the, I mean, anybody ever been near a jet? How close were you? A few feet. Running? Huh? It was running, it was uh, on? Oh, no, 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 of course not. Ah. Yeah, in Intrepid, how come that's Ah, Intrepid. <laughs> if you go to the Intrepid, yeah. there is a Kfir C7 there, I think it's the 537. If you will find the original book yeah. of the plane, the first page is my signature. Vandalism. Huh? Vandalism? No. <laughs> no. And few other pages you find in there. When they send it from the Israeli aircraft industries to the base, it went through me. I was the first one. I got the book. And that was me. So, a plane does crazy maneuvers. So they make sure that there's no, if there's a rivet missing, the first thing they'll do is gonna check the engine. Why? Of course, if it's, you know, in a place that it's uh, in front of them, why? Because it could be flew over there, and if there is a little nick on the turbine, of the compressor of the engine, that can cause the engine to stall because the air hits the turbine and then it creates a different angle and it creates a problem and then the plane crashes. Now, I'm talking to you all about a plane that's worth a few millions of dollars, sophisticated with missiles and, and a river that costs you a cent. Yes. 
Now, there are Jews, and we need to look at every Jew as a cell in the body. Everybody's needed. They have different jobs. Some people are brain cells. Some people are stomach cells. Some people are toenail cells. <clears throat> Which one is more important? Well, they're all important. They all need to work in harmony. Because, God forbid, if a person has a cancer, you have one little cell that decides to go crazy in his toe, it will affect the whole entire body. You need to understand that each and every Jew is important because there is a job that needs to be accomplished. A job that needs to be accomplished. If this job is not accomplished, what in the world the, the, the universe was created for? And therefore each generation gets its job that it need to do plus the job of generations that didn't accomplish what they need to do. Oh, wow, he's right. Roll over. Huh? Roll over. You better believe that. So somebody to do it. Like, let's say, for example, you're building a building, right? So you have a whole entire crew that comes, teams. People do the sheet rocks, people do the plumbing, people do this, and people do that. And let's say, for example, the plumbing team didn't come. They just don't want to come. But the, the, the sheetrock people say, oh, listen, we've got to do a job. We've got to put the sheetrock. They say, okay, well, how about the plumbing? Somebody needs to do it. So, okay, you know what, guys? I'll, keep, I'll give you a couple of dollars. Before you put the sheetrock, put the plumbing. Otherwise, I can't do the building. What's the point? <clears throat> and we need to understand how important this is. So how do I know? How do I train myself? that everybody is important. Well, you could simply understand that and think about it. Well, you could do something else. So, since we're talking about airplanes, you know that pilots have a big ego. They have like, whew, ego up to, up to heaven, especially if they're young in the, in the business. The new pilots are like, oh my goodness. The older they get, the better they get. Now, what happens? Those people, you have to understand, Pilots are not regular people. To be a pilot of a jet, and today even, a, let's say, an attack helicopter, I mean, you can't be a regular person. Their, their set of skills that they have, and the mind is out of this world. And they're not alpha males, they're like alpha plus plus. When they go up on flight, and they practice all the time, and many times they practice dog fights, and it's like always trying to outdo the other guy. But how does it work? Because they're so smart, it works like that. When you start, and that really has to do with, with Torah as well, when you start you know, engaging in a dog fight, all of a sudden, you come to a guy who really is not a alpha plus plus. He's like, he's off the charts. And you're saying, oh my goodness, this guy is great. And now you know that he's great and he's good. You learn to give even the other pilots acknowledge their, their talents because these are the people who are going to go to war with you. And you want to go to war with people like that. So when you go and you start to appreciate them, the animosity that we will have in our world here does not exist up there in the skies. Or, to that matter, in, let's say, uh, you know, in any other, in any other, almost, I mean, so it's a combat unit. It's going to be MERSOC, or it's going to be, uh, you know, you know, recon, or, or, you know, whatever you call it, PJs, whatever it is, because you you learn to appreciate the importance of the guy next to you, or even the Marines. We don't have that sense of unity 
And that's why it's very hard for us to acknowledge somebody else's quality. One of the problems that we do, and I'm going to tell you this straight out, you might not like what I say. One of the biggest mistakes that we can do is we make or we place people who are good, by, the all, by, by all means, they're good, but we put them on pedestals that it's so high for us that we can never reach, so we give up. Don't put people in pedestals. Don't say they're so great, I can never be that. So wait a minute. This person is so great. He's a person just like me. How come he did it and I did it? Well, you got to say, well, genetics. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. If you're going to go to uh, any of those training, whether it's ranger training or bud training or any of this training, not necessarily the most ripped guy is going to make it to the end line. And don't forget what people think, oh, buds, buds. Buds is just a selection. The real work is at the end, when you actually enter the teams, and then you realize that those people are, like, amazing. And we need to acknowledge what's good with the other person and to acknowledge the, the importance of his mission to all of us. And if I don't do that, there's never going to be unity. And we're never going to accomplish the mission. And we're always going to fail. And then we're going to get panicked. And we talk about being, things being hard before, right? But being hard is good, as I told you, it's good. Because there are many people who would like to go through life and, uh, you know, like a convertible. Driving around like this, maybe to have a little bouncy car or, you know, whatever you drive. But you have to understand when things are hard for you, you get into that zone, you're going to enter a place that you're going to have a tunnel vision. You've got to be in that zone. And that tunnel vision, you're going to, and you know, like for example, if you have a lot of four G force, before you pass out, you get like a tunnel vision. You know, that's, you know that, you know, that's why they give you exercises to do. And you know you're going to enter that zone, and in that zone that most people drop, there's going to be darkness for you. It's going to be dark there. And that's exactly what happens to Am Israel. And if you want to know why it's so difficult for the Jews, that's the reason. Because we need to enter the zone of discomfort. And in that zone of discomfort, there is darkness. It is dark. It's tight. It's dark. It's smelly. It's difficult. It's the rabbit hole. And what do one of those people do? Most people panic. And they jump off, off, off the thing and it's out and and we lose them, or they turn, if they're a little bit smarter, they, they'll reach right away to their flashlight to turn the light on. But what then what happens when you turn the light on? Oh, you see the light, but it's not enough because you need to save your battery. So turn it off again, and turn it on again, turn it off again. But that's the wrong thing to do. Just stay a minute in the darkness. Before you know, your eyes will get used to it. When your eyes get used to the darkness, you're not going to panic. You know, say, listen, I'm going to come out of here. And all of a sudden, you're going to realize, hey, buddy, there's a door there. And you put in the light on, you don't see it, but the guy sees it, says, there's a door. And he goes to the door, and he opens the door, and then you get to this, like, ah, that's exactly what happens. And then you understand it's not so difficult. Am Israel needed to do so. Am Israel would never have it easy, because we need to go into this darkness. That's what makes us tough. That's what makes us resilient. That's what makes us survive. Not to look like the easy way. I want to be like the rest of the nations. That's turning your flashlight on. That's not getting on with, with or saying, okay, now nice it's the real workout. <clears throat> and that, when you realize that, all of a sudden it's different. The Gemara says, Lo Baruch Hu Yisrael midat yoter aniyut. Being, being poor, Why? Because it's hard. And if it's hard, you're going to strive. And if you're going to strive, guess what will happen? 
you're going to do something about it. And when you're going to do something about it, you're going to get it. If HaKadosh Baruch Hu would bring, why HaKadosh Baruch Hu did not bring Mashiach 2,000 years ago? Because you need to work for it. You need to earn it. Because then it's going to be important to you. You need to understand that I, you need your, your fellow Jew to bring that job. So you're going to do not only whatever you can to make yourself strong, you're going to make him, and you're going to make sure you're going to leave him behind. You're going to develop responsibility towards your fellow Jew. And we need to internalize this. And we need to stop looking for ways out. Or what people say, well, Rabbi, can you give me a cooler here? I want a little way out. Is there like a loophole I can get myself in? I'll tell you, the only thing you're going to get in a loophole one day is your neck. And then it gets tight. Don't look for loopholes. To do it, I'll do it. What's the deal? That's what I need to do. I'll do it. Not a problem. Get that attitude. And that is what the Orach Haim is saying. The Orach Haim is saying, it says that when it says Adam ki akriv michem and so on and so forth, right? So it means that the hakrava, that closeness to Hashem has to come from you. God is not going to come and say, hey guys, I'm here. Hello. It's not Santa Claus going to come down in the chimney. You want me, God says? Okay, you come to me. I'm not coming to you. You're going to come to me. It has to come from you. You need to initiate it. Why? Because the Gemara tells us, You need to strive so much and want it, and then the Shefa will come. But the hit or the root, the awakening, had to be from here. And it says, <coughs> when it says Lemo, to say, Orachim says, Amar Laim Divre Kibushim, Bishvil Chem, Medaber, right? Moshe Rabbeinu says, Akadosh Baruch Hu talks to me only because of you. Only because of you. Why? Because Lamed Chet Shana Shayu Israel Bamidbar. The 48, the 38 years after the Meraglim, the Chet Meraglim, it says, Ve'ik Asher Tamu Kol Hashem Melchama Lamut Ve'idaber Hashem Melai. It says, for all these 38 years, because of you did war. What war did they do? But they went to war. They went to war when they entered the land. You went to war against Hashem. So for 38 years in the desert, when God spoke to Moshe, Moshe said to them, it wasn't because of my closeness. It was for your sake. Because he needed to com communicate with me, but to you. So it's only because of you. So that's why each one of us is important. Because it's for Klal Yisrael. It says, Oz Yirmoz lesavot et anshe achai lishtadel lekarev levavot am Yisrael avodat Hashem. You have to make an effort. Each and every one of us has to make an effort to bring another Jew on board. And it says, Velazei yikarek korban lehashem. You need to bring him. Mikem, from you, korban lehashem. You have to bring him closer to Hashem. You're already close. That's good. Good for you. But how about your fellow Jew? You're going to leave him behind. He's injured. He's not capable. He's not open spiritually yet as much as you are. He's, he didn't get this for whatever reason as much as you did. So you're going to leave him behind. And then you're going to call him brother. That doesn't work like that. So that's why it says, because it says, Ki al adam. Look what I said to you before. That's what the Orachim says. Because a person makes an avera, person sins. There is a gap between them and Hashem. Each and every one of us. He says, What? And they're going to be separated and further away from Hashem. HaKadosh Baruch Hu He's going to get angry with this. Why are you staying away from me? And therefore we need to do something to bring us closer. You need to act the, the carrot and stick. You can't just do, uh, hey guys, uh, when I come to shul, I give you free joints. That doesn't work like that. Carrot and stick. Carrot and stick. Hug and tell them, buddy, you're doing wrong. But I'm here for you. I'm going to help you. It has to be done. That's what the Orachim says. 
הקדוש ברוך הוא פאנש to those who close their eyes to that. למעלים עינו, he writes. וזה לך האות אשר ציווה השם להתחיל ממקודשיו. You are the guys who are on top. You are the guys, the leaders, the rabbis, and so on and so forth. You closing your eyes to that, I'm going to start with you. Because you should have known better. You should have inspired the people. That's why you are there. והקדוש ברוך הוא חפץ בקרבת כל אחד ואחד מישראל. הקדוש ברוך הוא wants every Jew to be close to him. And מידת הקרבה והריחוק, closeness, or, or further away from Hashem, right? It depends on, of course, on קיום המצוות, and not only doing the מצוות, but even more so, your attitude towards the מצוות. What is the attitude that you have when you're doing the מצוות? Doing God a favor? You're doing yourself a favor? You want to go to heaven? You want to have 72 virgins in heaven? I, mean, I don't know what they have, probably, you know. Why are you going to go to heaven? Why are you doing the mitzvah? What's the reason for that? Want to give you caviar in the heavens? No, I'm doing the mitzvah because God told me that. That's it. No ifs, no buts. I don't want anything. He told me, I do it. That's it. End of the story. End of the story in terms of that. But according to Kabbalah, we said the Shoresh Ara, the root of all evil, it's Ra is Rasun Atzmi, self will. To overcome that, I need to do something, and that's the Ratzon to give. Ra, Ratzon Atzmi, you give me. It's me, that's Tom, you give me. Give me, give me. What can I get from you? What can I get for you? Can you write me a check? Can you give me a car? Can you buy me a necklace? Can you do this for me? But what can I do for you? Can I buy you something? Can I do something for you? Can I help you with anything? You're overcoming everything else that will put you apart. Because now you're doing God's will. In a way, what you're turning is, His will will become your will. So uh, why am I doing the mitzvah? I don't know, that's what the Shem says, that's why I'm doing it, I don't know, Olam Abba, Olam Abba, I don't really care. And that's what he says, and that, that is hinted, Adam ki yakir mikem korban le Hashem, and he writes, and he says, Adam, dikduk lomar lashon chashivut, as it says, Bazoar, ki yakriv, umi yakriv, and who's going to bring this, right? Who's going to bring this, the, the korban? Mikem. From the leaser of you, I'm going to bring the korban, in other words, even those who, who acted against Hashem, we have, to bring, we have to bring them. In other words, you cannot leave them behind. I don't really care. And why is that? Because a person who is really dedicated to Hashem, is, is davuk be Hashem, you cannot stay, uh, you cannot say that it doesn't bother you that you have Jews that are not Shomer Torah Mitzvot. Because you feel, quote unquote, the pain of God. So that's something that you need to do. A person like this needs to bring, and a person who does kiruv le'avot and so on and so forth, who is mekarev rechokim and so on, Ora Chaim says something amazing. He says a person like this does not need to bring lo neder, lo nedava, nothing. Why? Ki en metziut la'avi lo chatat velo asham. There's no need for him to bring chatat or asham. Why? Because it says kol ha'mezakei tarabim. En chet ba'al yado. If you do something from yourself to benefit the masses, HaKadosh Baruch is going to make sure that you are not going to sin. So there's no need for that. Ve'en shogeg, and he's not going to be mistaken for something in Chaz V'Shalom, and because of that, there's no korban. Can you repeat that last part, what you said? Sure. I'll read to you what it says. It says, a person like this should not bring lo korban, lo neder, lo nedava. Why? Because the reality of chet does not exist for him. Why? Because it says the following. It says on Masechet Yomah Dav Pei Zayin Amud. Bet. Kol ha-mezakei tarabim. It's a 50-50 chance. <laughs> hey, you got to appreciate it. They could have said Aleph, you see? Kol ha-mezakei tarabim en chet ba'al yado. HaKadosh Baruch Hu would arrange it. In other words, it will be like he will close the way for you that this is not going to happen. Somebody's going to come uh, to do that. You know, it's like 
It's like in the movies, you know, when they have those cartoons, you know, it goes like this, and everything goes your way. And chet baal yado, and also shogeg. In other words, must shogeg. Let's say, for example, I didn't check the lettuce. Ah, let's say to check the lettuce. And I gave you a salad to eat. Now, you ate the salad, counting on me. Now, let's say, chaz v'shalom, you ate a bug, right? So you're going to be shogeg, and I'm going to be negligent, but you're going to be shogeg. So what will happen if you are Arabim, as soon as I give you the plate with the uh, lettuce, right, accidentally, quote-unquote, accidentally, come a little malach, takes your hand and knocks the down and nose on the floor, says, oh, don't worry about it, I'm not going to eat this. That's the way it works. Because you are doing God's work. When you are taking care of those in your people that are not as fortunate, you are saying, I'm not important. They are important. I'm going to go out of my way to help them. I'm going to go out of my way to bring him back to Hashem. Back to the Father. Because the says, that's my boy. Man. i got to take care of this guy. And that's what happens. And it says, it says most of the people need kapara for whatever it is, mina beima, and so on and so forth. But, I mean, everybody does something. But then there is the kapara of the tzibu, that that's the greatest kapara. Korban tzibu is the highest korban the power of the, the wicked god. And so you will be included in that because the kapara for you will be as well. But in terms of things like we have, that's not going to happen. And we need to understand that. We need to internalize us. And we need to care about our brothers and sisters who are not as fortunate. And sometimes we have friends that are kind of falling down. We need to bring them on board. You need to think like, like your soldiers. If you have a, a, one of your buddies in, that, that got injured in, in army territory, you're not going to live there. Ah, he's injured. Like, let, let him die there. Who cares? Let me save myself. No, you're going to run. And then it happens to you because you learn that. And we need to internalize this. We need to learn that as well. So Adam ki akriv korban mikem from you it has to come from you from inside. Kadosh Baruch Hu wants us hundred percent inside. When you start to do it like this, you're going to start appreciating one another, the ability, the quality. Let's stop looking at be what better about this one or better about this. Nobody will break even. If there is bad by someone, you should know. That has to be good with him as well. Equally as what you see bad in this person, you should know that it has to be equally good in him. And the fact that you didn't see it doesn't mean that he doesn't have it. You just chose to look at the bad, not to look at the good. Your job is to find the good and bring it to the light. And by you bring it to the light, you acquiring yourself, Mikem, from you, from yourself, you acquiring yourself a friend. You brought them korban. So it has to come from internally out to bring everybody else on board. We'll do that. You don't have to worry about Putin. You don't have to worry about Biden. You don't have to worry about price of gas. Don't worry about it. It's just going to be good. HaKadosh Baruch will make it happen. But we need to start going. Time is running out. Time is really running out. And unfortunately, Jews are running out as well. So we need to uh, really roll our sleeves and go into dark places and to bring everybody on board. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom.